This is Restless. Welcome back to Restless, a post-mortem on the young, restless, and reformed. And I promise to you, we will be doing that today. Pastor Michael is here with us. I am your host, Matt. This is the Restless Podcast. Pastor Michael, how are you doing today? You know, it is, it's a good day. The life of of, uh, a pastor does not always have a consistent schedule. And so, um, although we're recording this when we normally record, I feel like the rest of this week so far has been all over the place schedule wise, and it's going to keep being that way. If, uh, my calendar has anything to say about it, <laughs> be it with the other meetings and, and things that I have going on this week. Uh, but it's, that's okay. I actually kind of like that. You know, I like when we have different times and seasons and things change a little bit. It's kind of fun. Adds a little spice. Mm. Indeed, it does. The spice I just added was opening this Kirkland sparkling water, which if you heard that that fall into the microphone while Pastor Michael was talking, that was my can falling. And then as I opened it, it exploded and sprayed around in my basement. Um, so I, too, am experienced the spice of life. <laughs> um, but today we are here to continue our discussion over the origin story of the Gospel Coalition. And while, of course, we could explain this into forever, I think at least for now, we will leave it here. Um, Now, if someone has a clear idea of, or someone we could interview, uh, because, for example, someone asked us a question of, I would love a show that explained where all the funding for all of these things came from in the beginning. Let me just say this. What an excellent question. And an answer to a question in the amount of time I did researching this, I have no answer for you. Um, I was just telling Pastor Michael that I was looking for the earliest list of the TGC council members, which would have included names like Mark Driscoll, CJ Mahaney, Tulian Chavijan, maybe even the one, the man, the myth, the legend, James McDonald. Um, and he was I, at least on there, right? Like, I don't know. I don't remember if he was if, at the very beginning or not. And if he was, like, if he was, you know, if they had the title of counsel for him. Um, but the earliest you can find uh, the TGC council list is May of 2014. It's likely they published the official council list probably in response to Driscoll and maybe some of these other men leaving because Driscoll left in 2014. And so I can't find the list. I'm sure there was some kind of a leadership list, but again, they've gotten rid of that URL. And so you'd have to know what that URL is exactly to find it. Um, were you to were you to want to find the original list? And I'm sure someone can find it out there somewhere for us. Um, but for the purposes of what we are doing, we are going to cover um, the preamble to TGC. Um, and so, Pastor Michael, um, where we left off was we were describing, well, we listened to some of the inaugural address from D.A. Carson. Um, and we gave a little bit of the background of how it came from this meeting in 2005 where Tim Keller and Don Carson issued 40 invitations and all 40 showed up. Now, One thing we should note is Tim Keller at that original meeting mentioned um, that the reformed leadership has fractured before and how big of a problem that was. He described that in the aftermath of Jonathan Edwards' death, one of the biggest problems that happened was a um, Edwards, he believed, was the picture of the man who held together revivalism, orthodoxy, apologetics right? All of these kinds of engagement. Um, But when he died, there was a separating of the theologians, right? The Princeton theologians were confessional in their theology. Keller told this original group they were not strong in cultural apologetics. Um, Jonathan Edwards Jr., they advanced cultural apologetics, but um, uh, were re- you know, the New Haven theology, they were rewriting some reformed ideas. And then Charles Fitty and many others in the Second Great Awakening claimed Edwards as the inspiration for their revivalism, but were neither confessional uh, 
nor much for engaging culture. And Keller said he believed that exact thing was happening in 2005 among evangelicals. Mm -hmm. um, reformed leaders gathered at TEDs. Other evangelicals sought to change the perception of Christians through cultural engagement and social justice. And a third group promoted giant events. We might call those mega churches with evangelistic fervor using the latest technology. And one of Keller's questions to these men is, who could hold together these three groups today? So Pastor Michael, what do you think about that um, that effort, right, the, the comparison? Because the reason we're going through this is because we're gonna look at the preamble of all the TGC founding documents before that they put out for you to read. Like it's about who they are, and I think you are going to hear these things reflected there. So that's why we're walking um, through some of these older events. Um, but Pastor Michael, what do you think about that effort or that reading of where evangelicalism was um, and even its comparison to earlier American Christianity? Yeah, I mean, it fits, right? It fits everything we have talked about for years at this point um it it fits the reform resurgence thesis it it fits all of these things but even now as you said it i don't know if i've ever thought about it quite like this but even hearing how um at least how you just laid it out i don't know how similar that is to how keller himself said it but when those were the different like factions that were splintering you just wonder if like is that actually something you should want to hold together does that make sense ding good question that's i mean that's how i felt when you were saying it okay here you've got big big box entertainment driven events based mega church and okay well that's like we can't hold on to that right like that that seems like well that's a well that's on fire um and uh so we can't hold on to that okay you've got the like you know, what we've now come to see is kind of the woke social justice warrior types, the emergent church, um, very socially focused, but clearly social gospel, right? They're, um, they did not preach the true gospel. Okay, well, on fire, like there's, you don't hold on to that without getting burned. Uh, I can't remember the other one. I, I can't remember right. what what the other group was. But anyway, I all it sounds to me though is a little bit like um that's this seems like you're actually multiple generations after when you should have tried to hold it together. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Um like maybe there was a time when you could have stopped that from happening. But the it seems much more like the fracturing has already taken place. Yeah. And this goes back to what we talked about last time is basically a theory of managed decline. Mm. That actually what's happening, especially if the model was British evangelicalism, like that's, they basically said, this is where we're heading, or like we should have something like what's set up here. Well, that's a, like that's setting up a, a church for a position of decline, mm. um, which being obviously in the negative world, there, there's a sense in which, yeah, you have to be prepared for that. You have to be thinking about that. But that's not how it was marketed anyway. It wasn't marketed in that way um and i don't it doesn't seem like that's exactly how they were thinking about it it just seems in in hindsight to be what ended up being the case right and I, so i think what's interesting about that is there are probably it tells us two things one um it can tell us it can actually help explain why the gospel coalition grew in prominence so quickly from 2005 to like 2012 like and and again they didn't publish any of this till 2007 because the pools they were trying to draw from were so wide right if you're going to invite right pca pastors ligon duncan people like this mega church pastors right and you're gonna like that is you are you are as as brad vermerlin said you are attempting to jump into the very middle of evangelicalism right and jump in the front two i do think there there is a great question of if there is any kind of goal we should have in holding all of all of these things together um 
because I don't know that we should. So Carson, um, he talked about all the kinds of fracturing that we could see during um, during this time. You know, he he used some current event warnings like that ho- views of homosexuality could splinter the church, um, that there was population, um, the population depletion of Europe uh, meant you would see multi-ethnic and urban churches. Um, there might be people with more interest in theological confessions than there ever have been. And so, um, and I, again, the, I'm summarizing this from Colin Hansen's report on this original meeting. So, uh, uh, friends of D.A. Carson, uh, if if I'm incorrectly summarizing his questions, I am going to quote the questions directly from Colin Hansen that he asked this group. Considering this threat, because um, he thought the denominations were weak and that there was a place for a new association and that the the denominations in America at that point were weaker than they had been during the American Civil War or the Reformation. And so he said, considering this threat, how could these pastors organize a prophetic movement calling churches back to the center of the gospel, TM? Would they need a confessional statement, a theological vision for ministry, a publication along the lines of Christianity Today that explored contemporary theology and ministry trends and shared creative, hopeful, and doctrinally rooted proposals, regional networks? that could collaborate on church planting and campus ministry and discipleship resources, and even a national conference for church leaders that modeled expositional preaching, but also shared practical tips on concerns like cross-cultural ministry. Could they wield emerging technologies through the internet for global influence? And here is um, uh, Colin Hansen's uh, um, commentary on these questions. Less than five years later, they had all answered every question with yes. Wow. So this is what, uh, so, right. So these are the questions, um, at least Colin Hansen is summarizing, D.A. Carson was asking these 40 men to consider um, when they organized in 2005. What do you think of uh, D.A. Carson's kind of call, right? So if, if, um, if, Tim Keller's question was, is there a way to hold the Western church together? D.A. Carson's question is, is there a way, is there a way to organize something that will solve so many different problems, right? That's, that's much more what he's getting at Mm -hmm. in his. Yeah, it does sound like you're just trying to form a new denomination. Um, That's more or less what you're doing, but you're trying to draw from different churches in different ways. What I keep thinking about is, the audience, right? So mm-hmm. it's whenever we think about these things, it's good to think about the setting that this wasn't spoken to everybody necessarily. This was spoken to specific people. And this is, remind me, this was the people that went on to be the council members, right? Yep. This was the like Tim Keller. And this is the meeting in 2005 where Tim Keller and DA Carson basically proposed what became the Gospel Coalition. Yeah. Then they met two years later to create what the documents would be and have their inaugural conference. Yeah. So um, how many of the guys in that room were in just like a regular church? 150 people or less. That I'd like to know. I'd like to know like how many of them were or or how many of them were Mark Driscoll's right uh joshua harris is also uh, was on the council yep darren until... darren patrick i i did look up uh some of the early names that you know were taken up potentially james mcdonald right like how many of them were just those kinds of guys mm-hmm. when you're speaking to those kinds of guys um guys in those positions it it seems to me that this takes on a, a little bit of a different flavor almost um Mm -hmm. especially thinking about hey this is something that will really like influence the world right you're using this big language now what's interesting to me about a lot of this is that da carson has never been uh like he wasn't uh, a mega church guy right 
he went to a pretty regular free church. I, as far as I know, he might still be there. I don't know if he still is, but but for the longest time, was just at a regular, everyday evangelical church um, with you know, uh, not a not a huge huge place, and spent pretty much his whole at least his career while he was at Ted's, which was a long time. I mean, pretty much spent that time at the same church, as far as I know. He was, a, in other words, he was just a regular congregant in a lot of ways. Um, that, But that, so the way that you think, if you're in that kind of a position, if you're that kind of guy, by the way, I have tremendous respect for D.A. Carson. I know we laughed at him once on that one episode for oh. Valentine's Day, but, but it wasn't because I was laughing at him, right? Because I have tremendous respect for him and his ministry. I was told, I don't know if this is true, so somebody could fact check me. Uh, but I was told while I was at Ted's that that uh, Carson very regularly on his taxes would get audited because uh, the IRS basically didn't believe how much money he was giving away compared to his income because mm -hmm. he gives away so much of his revenue from his books oh, wow. that it just would like he would just get audited all the time because it seemed wrong, like he was doing something wrong because he's that kind of guy. And I, I believe that. Right. I, I, I mean, as far as I can tell, he really is a. Uh, a, a tremendous uh, and and uh, uh, really um, great example of of a godly Christian academic. Uh, but when you say some of those things about what it looks like to build a denomination, change you know, uh, change the face of evangelicalism, and you're talking to these guys, right, production guys. And that's what a lot of these guys were, right? I mean, we know that. They maybe talked a big game, but we know the Driscolls, the Darren Patricks, the the Josh Harris's, um, a lot of those types of guys. And that's why I would love to know exactly who was on that original list. Mm -hmm. uh, but those guys were production guys. They weren't um they weren't theologians. They weren't, some of them were not Christians. <laughs> so we have found out since. Yep. Uh, but they also just were not, like, they're not the people that you would generally want crafting the theological statement of what is effectively a new denomination. Mm. Um, and so anyway, I, I just, it's interesting to me that if that was the desired goal, that I know they didn't call it a denomination, but more or less, especially coming from the evangelical world, that's what you're talking about. Well, what they're doing is they're doing the same thing the generation of men did before them. And maybe both generations had the right reason, had a good reason to do this. And probably some reasons were better than others. Both generations of men decided to give all of their energy to the parachurch. Yes. They yeah. decided that this is what they were going to do, that they were fundamentally. Now, again, many of the men involved in TGC were very giving to their own church and own denomination. Right. So that. Um, but right. The generation of men before them all founded Campus Crusade. Right. Inner varsity, uh, you know, political. Right. Just a man. Again, mm -hmm. every parachurch that we have in the West today was founded a generation before Tim Keller and D.A. Carson. Yeah. Um, and so now what we have is an attempt at renewal in the churches through another parachurch ministry. Through a parachurch. Right. And what's so fascinating is we could probably trace a lot of the problems. Not I'm, I'm not a, like, hey, let's blame the parachurch for everything Me that neither. ever happened. But you could trace a lot of the problems that they were seen in the church, right? The the problems of the kind of big box mega church, the problems of of the uh, you know social gospel that was pervading a lot, that the problems of the emergent movement and leaving behind traditional Christianity, all those things. Um, a lot of those impulses come out of the same drivers of the parachurch. Mm. They like they they grow together. And we see that now, right? I mean, we see that in so many parachurch organizations that have gone down those same roads that right. the church was going down. Uh, and I just wonder if if that's exactly right, what you say, that what they're doing 
is they're trying to solve the church's problem through the parachurch when that was actually part of the problem to begin with. Yeah. Um, right. I, I, again, what you see is, um, and you understand why um, during the height of Protestant liberalism, and if in 2005 these men thought their denominations were um, so weak and, and horrible, you know, that poor Albert Moeller and John Piper and Mark Driscoll and, you know, all these men in these horrible denominations all had to, you know, band together. Um, you understand us, well, again, the generation before, why it would be so refreshing to work with Christians who actually agree with you on something, right? Like when you were watching, you know, uh, liberalism take over, it would be really refreshing to be like, and I'm now getting to do evangelism with people who believe Jesus rose from the dead. Yeah. You get why that why that sounds a lot better than like what you were doing at your synod or presbytery mm -hmm. or district meetings. Um the problem is is the parachurches in whatever good or bad it is, it's always Christianity without discipline. Mm -hmm. And probably the thing you need to do if you're if your denomination is in trouble is engage in discipline, like engage in bringing charges, engage in caring about what's happening in your own, in your presbytery, engage in care and build relationships with men throughout your denomination. Um, not because I don't want the Southern Baptists to do great. Right. That's not what I'm, you know, like that's not the, the motivation. Um, but all of that is way less, like, uh, glorious than I now have a national conference where we get to hear theologically rich sermons, um, you know, and practical tips on cross-cultural ministry. So I don't know. I, I just, I do think it is interesting, uh, at least to consider that as part of what they solve. So let's go to their preamble. This is where... Uh, they excl explain who they are. And so here we will start with a very familiar face. I have not watched this video of Tim Keller. I don't know if he's going to read the preamble. If he did, that'd probably be nice because then I wouldn't be reading it. If not, we'll hear what he has to say and then I will read the preamble. It's not very long. And we'll see um, uh, how they uh, introduce themselves. Every generation is at risk of losing the gospel. Temptations, distractions, false teachings, idols. So much can compromise our faith and derail our mission. But if the church is to thrive, we must be clear on the gospel, on what it is and what it means for all areas of life. That's why the Gospel Coalition exists. We are a coalition of Christ followers from around the world banding together to renew the contemporary church in the ancient gospel let me just say really quick sorry that i fooled everyone by saying tim keller was going to introduce this he was on the front <laughs> he, it was it, it appeared like we were going to get him on a white background speaking uh and but, maybe we still will yeah but we've been getting this kind of f fancy very not the gospel coalition's energy kind of video introducing them but we'll keep going we are pastors, parents, students, artists, entrepreneurs, church planters. We are from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. We are not united by culture, nationality, or politics, but by the cross of Jesus Christ. We gather together to proclaim God's glory. We equip one another to know God's word. We engage culture to illuminate God's truth. We are a movement of reform and renewal, helping Christians love God, know his word, and engage the world with grace and truth. We are not pursuing power or prosperity, popularity or applause. We are pursuing faithfulness to God and the glorious gospel of his son, Jesus Christ. As Jesus said, in this world, we have much tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In his death and resurrection, there is salvation and forgiveness of sins, new and eternal life, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and a reconciliation to God. This is the good news that the world desperately needs to hear. And spreading this news is what the Gospel Coalition is about. 
I'm wondering. I gotta see when they publish this. Maybe this. Yeah, was I was gonna say, how old is this? Has got to be newer. May, I, and I'm wondering if maybe it's a replacement um, for when you know uh, Tim Keller passed away, right? Um, and that would be totally appropriate. Right. This thing. When did this video get launched? Let's go. Show me. Show me. Show me when this. Okay. Here we go. It's a five-year-old video. Okay. So. All right, Pastor Michael. So this would be a, an interesting episode in itself if we just walked through that video, by the way, and the like clips they chose. Because you're hearing this if you're just listening on the podcast, but um, it's a whole video you can go and watch, and it's got a lot of interesting choices of background images that would be interesting to look at. It would, Pastor Michael. What is the what is the sense you got? Uh, what that you got with what they are, what this video is produced to say, and um, its general environment, its general message. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a church. Oh, I was just going to say, we are the ones united of every tribe, tongue, and nation. Yeah. We are the invisible so church. We are the invisible church. We are the kingdom of God. <laughs> like that's how that's how it sounded. That's how it um, sounded. Which was it did make me feel a little uncomfortable. Um, it I, it feels like you're trying to start a denomination without a denomination, right? You are right. like you're saying. Do you? This is a parachurch church. Mm. Um, all right. So let's read the preamble. So obviously that video was not produced, uh, and that way of speaking, I think I actually think that video probably is much more a reflection of how they would describe what they're doing now. I yes. don't think that sounds very much how they would have described it yes. in 2007. I think so. I think you're right. But um, I wonder if even as we've been talking about, you can see where the seed of that would end up. So um, you let, maybe wouldn't have seen it then, but yep. you can see how it would get to where it is now. So now let's listen. Let's read, because that did not read. Let's read the preamble. It's four paragraphs long. Um, and I think you'll see that the terms like reform and renewal, those are just not the ways people were speaking in 2005. So um, preamble, we are a fellowship of evangelical churches in the reformed tradition, deeply committed to renewing our faith in the gospel of Christ and to reforming our ministry practice. I guess there those words are and to reforming our ministry practices to conform fully to the scriptures. We have become deeply concerned about some of the movements within traditional evangelicalism that seem to be diminishing the church's life and leading us away from our historic beliefs and practices. On the one hand, we are troubled by the idolatry of personal consumerism and the politicization of the faith. On the other hand, we are distressed by the unchallenged acceptance of theological and moral relativism. These movements have led to the easy abandonment of both biblical truth and transformed living mandated by our historic faith we are not only here we not only hear of these influences we see their effects we have committed ourselves to invigorating churches with new hope and compelling joy based on the promises received by grace alone through faith alone in christ alone so paragraph one pastor michael what are your thoughts on this idea yeah, I, you know, I'm trying to, um, like you, compare it to the video that we just watched. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting to see the different poles that mm -hmm. they see themselves as the center of. Yep. Right? So politicized faith, uh, consumeristic faith or idolatry, um, uh, uh, basically theological uh, and moral relativism or theological liberalism on the one hand. And so uh, it's interesting to see where they kind of settle themselves in yeah. the midst of that. And when you think back, you think about, you know, kind of the, the religious right, uh, Pat Robertson type world. You think about the emergent church like we've talked about. Uh, you think about the big box mega churches. Okay, yeah, like you see how they, they would maybe see themselves as, as kind of taking a stand in the midst of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, so. I I do think there's something interesting here. How accurate in the things they see as issues, 
that are that are affecting the church how accurate do you think that description is not of 2005 but of uh 2024 interesting how Um, how how relevant are those concerns today man i i don't know that they're that any of them are gone by any means uh they still seem like true challenges and problems to the of the church to me um that i you know i don't know i i I would have to think about it for a little while i think Uh, um when we think about what we did recently talking about the newest and latest driscoll controversy in this weird mega church men's conference with uh sword swallower and tanks and and monster trucks and like those sorts of things i'm like yeah okay yeah personal consumerism big box mega church you definitely still see that for sure Mm. Uh, i wonder if at their time they were thinking more so um in terms of the prosperity gospel Mm. uh because i do i remember when you know the prayer of jabez and and uh what's you know the smiley guy that i'm forgetting the name of down in houston and yeah osteen and like these were like they were basically i would say like taking massive ground in the church like it was normal in a regular evangelical church to be very, have heavy influences from those things. Mm. Um, I, I'm sure that that's still around. I, I think that uh, they did, there was a pretty significant work at um, combating some of that, mm. where it definitely did turn the tide in that way. Now, I think I'm going to I'm going to make two statements and then I'm going to ask an interesting question. My two statements are, I wonder if this is why um, articles on TGC feel very free to say you're probably idolizing the family. You're probably uh, you should be willing to suffer or you should be willing to be single or lose, you know, whatever, because that is seen as a reflection of personal consumerism and why TGC um, would basically side with those who would say terms like Christian nationalism would be an unchristian and fundamentally negative understanding of public life because they would be rooted in these impulses. They, they would see them all these kinds of things as impulses. Politicizing the faith. Yeah. That's well, and what's interesting is that if, Now, we know that there was some response in what they were doing early on to the religious right, again, Pat Robertson type stuff. Um, But it was also, it seems to me, and this is what I, I, it seems to me like in my personal experience, I ran into more in the YRR. There was definitely also that combating of what was a, you know, a progressive politics seeking into, yep, social gospel and, and a lot of that going on too. And so, so especially in you know especially in the emergent church circles that i was ever around or or saw in action um that was so common and so you see that too and and so yeah, I, yeah. I wonder how they would change the definition of those things now like it, yeah. is it is that still the the problem or where is the problem in the politicization I also struggle to know how, because obviously they've tried many things for cultural engagement, uh, film reviews, music reviews, lots of discussion of these. It's hard for me to understand how to differentiate that cultural engagement from our completely consumeristic society Mm. and not just uh, being a participation. Yeah, Um, interesting. I also think even this idea of reforming our ministry practices to more to to conform to the scriptures obviously the thing that i long term coming into the wire are even very influenced by the gospel coalition i never experienced the ideas that are related to how presbyterians understand the depth like what that means mm. right um and so there had to be there was a very non-confessional definition of those things. Yeah. Um, all right. So here we go. We believe that in many evangelical churches, a deep and broad consensus exists regarding the truths of the gospel. Yet we often see the celebration of our union with Christ 
replace replaced by the age old attractions of power and affluence or by monastic retreats into ritual liturgy and sacrament what replaces the gospel will never promote a mission hearted faith anchored in the enduring working itself out in unashamed discipleship eager to stand the tests of kingdom calling and sacrifice <laughs> dude we have Got what to get, a mess of words. <laughs> we have got to get some uh, periods use in this in these words. We desire to advance along the King's Highway, always aiming to provide gospel advocacy, encouragement, and education so that current and next generation church leaders are better equipped to fuel their ministries with principles and practices that glorify the Savior and do good for those he shed his life's blood man i mean this is just like get a lot word. of yeah a lot of slogans and taglines in there um there was something you know you think about uh how centered it clearly is on mission mm. um so it's it's mission driven in what does right what uh talking like so in they talk about the mission of, uh, or promoting mission-hearted faith, which is contrasted to what comes earlier as um, attractions of power and affluence and monastic retreats into ritual liturgy and sacrament. And mm -hmm. it's just an interesting way that they contrast that. I'm, I'm not sure, I guess, exactly what they mean, in contrasting those things, uh, but yeah. but I find it interesting. Also, you find the gospel as adjective pop up all over. Yeah. Gospel advocacy, gospel yeah. encouragement, gospel education, um, which what we've talked about that doesn't that does not align with how D. A. Carson was speaking to the gospel in that first initial talk. Um, it's very different, and yet it's it's right here. Yep. Let me make a. Uh, uh, an observation that might be is not as important as the ones Pastor Michael just made and might be unfair. But if you've ever wondered why so many articles at the Gospel Coalition are 4,000 words long when you're like, we didn't need, this is so long. These last two sentences are the longest two sentences uh, that I've ever read live on this show. <laughs> uh, so wordiness wordiness gospel wordiness has always been <laughs> value i think you know it makes sense when you're thinking about again the guys who were in that initial 40 oh, if know. a lot of them were these these um large church pastors known for their maybe more of their displays of marketing yeah. than actual um theological prowess uh but like I just read as you read that, I thought if you get just any regular Christian in the room and you would have read that to them, like, hey, we're coming up with this preamble for for what we're all about. What do you think about this? Any just like regular like blue collar Christian would have been like, What? Yeah. What did you just say? Yeah. What did you just say? <laughs> did you just say gospel advocacy? Like right. <laughs> what right. are you talking about? And uh God bless brother Pastor John Piper, but right, this is this is the way he speaks as well. <laughs> it is like I'm going to have 25 adjectives and four <laughs> clauses, and then the and then it's fine. And the rest of my sermon is going to be explaining each of those adjectives and all of those clauses, right? Uh, but it is it is a very wordy way to speak. All right, two more paragraphs before we get out of here. We want to generate a unified effort among all peoples, an effort that is zealous to honor Christ and multiply his disciples, joining in a true coalition for Jesus. Such biblically grounded and united mission is the only enduring future for the church. This reality compels us to stand with others who are stirred by the conviction that the mercy of God in Jesus Christ is our only hope of eternal salvation. We desire to champion this gospel with clarity, compassion, courage, and joy, gladly linking hearts with fellow believers across denominational, ethnic, and class lines. 
and this is where you get the like but maybe not class lines in our council right <laughs> Sure. Hey, we're happy. We're happy for you to read our stuff, but probably, probably you're not going to end up in our actual council room coming up with the preamble because you guys would be like, what are you talking about? No one knows what this means. Yeah. Yep. I. They only serve this kind of word salad at high class restaurants. Let's put it that way. <laughs> our desire is to serve. <laughs> Our desire is to serve the church we love by inviting all our brothers and sisters to join us in an effort to renew the contemporary church in the ancient gospel of Christ so that we truly speak and live for him in a way that clearly communicates to our age. As pastors, we intend to do this in our churches through ordinary means of grace. So that last one was written by the people who want multi-ethnic ministry this one was written by the like presbyterians as pastors we intend to do this in our churches through the ordinary means of grace prayer the ministry of the word baptism the lord's supper and the fellowship of the saints we yearn to work with all who in addition to embracing the confession and vision set out here seek the lordship of christ over the whole of life with the unabashed hope in the power of the holy spirit to transform individuals communities and cultures and below, you can find the links to their confessional statement and theological vision for ministry. And it is not just a link to the Westminster Confession of Faith, it, which is a misstep. <laughs> <laughs> Missed opportunity. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. Uh, yeah. I, I, so we, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about there's there are some fine things in here. Right? Yeah. There's there's clearly a fine desire to make the gospel central again in an evangelical church that broadly had begun to move away from it. Mm. But at the same time, it seems to me like you keep, you're trying to keep some of the pieces that had already led to the, I guess the, the fracturing that had already led to the going off after other idols. Mm. Um, you're, you seem to be maintaining or keeping hold of, trying to keep hold of some of the very, you know, elements that maybe drove you in that direction. And that's maybe where we could also say this idea of the, you know, you're trying to fix the church through the parish, as opposed to going the route that the scripture, which gives us the gospel, is actually directing us. I think, again, what what I especially heard by the end here is um, because right, a person who really is like, what we really need are these ordinary means of grace, right? Like you're, you don't naturally conclude that as your philosophy of ministry and go, we need more coalitiony things. Yeah. Like if that's like, <laughs> right. if that's what you're, um, you're deeply rooted, um, We've strayed from the ordinary gospel, and then here's this mass of words about right. what we need. What? And so what I actually think, there are there are two things that I think there are questions here. One, this is the influence I think that Gospel Coalition had on you and I early on. It pointed out to us, there is a, I don't, well, I will just say there is a better religion of Christianity than you know. It start, and it began to walk out for evangelicals like us, uh, whether it be the five solas, right? Certain reformed distinctives, mm -hmm. um, what preaching the Bible, uh, right? Expository preaching, yeah. All of the what all of these things are that for many of us who were young in um these kind of fluffy mega churches um found oh wow something this is way better right um and and then when i started having questions that frankly many of the christians around me had never bothered even asking i could literally go to a website where they're like yes. oh yeah. you now are wondering what um all the i what all the ideas are that are excluded by justification by faith alone mm -hmm. because you heard someone say the most important thing about being saved is your personal response to it and you go that feels like a work 
I'm doing. Yep. And you're right. Like, and, and then would explain all the ways like that, that worked out. Yes. So there is in one sense where that is in a sense, a rescue mission into evangelicalism. Yes. And for that, I'm profoundly thankful. Very grateful. Here's the other question though. And this is a question that Presbyterians, because of our actually beliefs about the church, we actually have to deal with and will deal with probably until everyone's Presbyterian. Boom. There we go. Because Pastor Michael, that post mill, when everyone's Presbyterian. The issue we have is Presbyterians, we have very firm convictions about the church, what we are to do in worship, um, the preaching of the word, right? Like even in our Presbytery where there is a decently diverse group of us right if any man in our presbytery moved to where either you and i were and planted a church no matter who it was we would now have the church that we are most similar to yeah like it has just arrived in town right. right no matter how different they were in pca terms and so the question the presbyterians but the, the another part of the conviction presbyterians have also had is we are not a, we are not the exhaustive visible or invisible church. Mm. Other churches are part of the true church of Jesus Christ, right? Yeah. This is what makes our um our much to our chagrin. Much to our chagrin. <laughs> and like, and this is part of what should, you know, we make we make like royal claims about how Jesus chooses to run his church, right? This is why we got the name Presbyterian, because we were the people that said. Actually, the method of church government isn't really up to us and our wisdom or church history. Jesus' crown rights decide it. And everyone's like, wow, that's a pretty bold claim. And we were like, I guess it is. Um, <laughs> but the question we always then had to deal with is, well, if that Congregationalist church is a true church of Jesus Christ, what unity, what um what do we owe them in terms yep. of loyalty, help, uh, part, especially in America, the question became partnership and mission. Mm -hmm. And I think you see this question, TGC rescue mission for people in evangelicalism. I'm all on board with rescue mission to the mega churches. I mean, or how do we partner with the mega churches as we have went on? As I think I said on our podcast when we were talking about Driscoll at that men's mega church conference, different religion than me. No interest in partnership. Right. And so I think that the the it it ends up causing this question of what does it actually mean to pursue the oneness God desires in his church, from his church? Um and and how we actually need what we actually need to do on it and if and as you said right it we maintained a number of the things in evangelicalism that maybe were part of the problem originally and so if that's the case i i don't know if the goal is to hold together with that yeah so we're you even mentioned what seems to have been a great benefit of the Gospel Coalition and why we're still like grateful, very much so. That's right. The work of the Gospel Coalition is it became a bridge, uh, but it became a bridge to the church, at least in a lot of cases. But there's a lot of cases in which it didn't. And it seems in, in some ways that from the beginning, even in what we read, trying to do almost a denominational thing yourself, what that actually kind of leads to is like you're building a bridge, but it just, like, it just ends. It's, it is just the bridge. That's all you're building um, rather than actually moving people where in some of the literature and some of the ways it seemed like you wanted moving people uh, into deeper fellowship within the church around the gospel. Um, and, and instead it just stopped there for many. Well, this has been our review of, again, understanding the benefit and the limits of the Gospel Coalition um, to help us understand it is important. 
And we hope this show was valuable to you. Um, and we will keep doing them as Cranky Presbyterians. Next week, we will be back doing uh, some more things from the Apostles' Creed as it's time to catch up on the Ascension and Pentecost. For those of you who are not clearly not truly Reformed who are celebrating those things. <laughs>